Thank you, Jeff. Thank you all for coming back. I expect you all are going to be lapsing slow into a calorie coma. <laughs> Did any of you have any of you ever seen my public television series Beekeeping thing? Yep. You see some nodding heads. Um, you remember in that television show I talked about how I got started keeping bees and how my dad got me started when I was, I think, 13. Well, he's here. Yeah, my dad. Dad back there. So if you like that TV show and you like what came from it, <laughs> and you're still keeping these, and ultimately thank him. I'm glad that he came down from Logansport uh, to see what exactly it is I'm up to. Uh, well, if, if half of what I said this morning is true, then it, it has something to say about honey and breeding. And um, just to really pick your interest and keep you awake an extra five minutes, I, I threw that provocative title up there. Um, because I am actually going to be kind of asking that question. Um, do we in fact breed the honeybee? Can we in fact breed the honeybee? And I think we all consider honeybee breeding kind of the holy grail of thinking. Um, we don't like the fact that we're using exotic chemicals in our beehives. Um, we don't like all of the um, pesticides they're exposed to and the viruses that are affecting them and, and things. And we always, 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 you will not go to a bee meeting from sea to shining sea that does not invoke the holy grail of bee breeding. Will you? No, I, I think I'm safe in saying this. We all think that this is the, the big thing that we're all after. I want to just sort of lay out there this afternoon sort of a, a critical view of that question. And I want us all beginning now to start asking yourself how successful is bee breeding and has bee breeding been? Okay, that's going to be kind of a question laid out there throughout this whole talk. And I want you to <coughs> Uh, just asking you, maybe start right now. Is bee breeding a success? Yes. Okay, we hear a yes. Okay. Well, good. We'll keep that thought open. I consider it an open question. Uh, and again, I'm thinking sort of from a practical point of view, from a bee health worker point of view, and sort of a historian of bee keeping point of view. And I sometimes allow myself to lapse into pessimism on that count. But I'm not quite so sure that we have had a real ringing product, something that you can hang your hat on that solves uh, beekeeping problems at the level that we want to. Let me paint it this way. Contrast the ink that has been spilt, thinking about, talking about, writing about, experimenting about bee breeding, and contrast that with the product that you hold in your hand that solves all your problems. And it seems like we're always on the way, 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 on the way. On the way. Someday, someday, we will be there. And, and I just want you to kind of live in that tension a minute and just kind of <coughs> think about that and critically think about it and ask yourself, where are we? What is the track record? And, um, I am not an iconoclast, okay, I'm not going to bash on the reading. What I'm hoping to do is come full circle by the end of this talk and show you how, yes, we do need the breeding. However, I do wonder if we have sort of under-exploited vast areas of honeybee's biology and just sort of ignored all of that in favor of this. Okay, that's, where, that's what we're doing in this talk. It's a critical appraisal of bee breeding and what does the biology of the animal um, have to teach us about using genetics as a tool to address bee health problems. Next, please, Greg. Well, this is our Apis <coughs> mellifera. Um, pretty large natural range all the way from the Arctic Circle down to the Cape of South Africa. And across that, there's 20-some, 20 25, 26, 27, some recognized races, which are a race is 
inextricably attached to geography. Uh, evolution and geography go hand in hand. These species will parse out very frequently based on geographic boundaries, things like the Sahara Desert that separates northern Africa from southern. And you cause these, these barriers to reproductive intermingling. It's why Lagustica, the Italian bee, is what it is. It's the Alps across the top of Italy that geographically isolated the proto Lagustica down in the Italian peninsula and kept it reproducing with Caucasica to the north of the Alps. So geography and subspeciation are inextricably linked. But the point is, as a species, Apis mellifera has quite a bit of genetic variation. It has been, remember I was talking this morning about the genetic resources that queens can bear on their colonies. Well, as a species, it's got a lot of genetic resources in the bank. That's a lot of real estate across planet Earth that it's been able to um, carve an engine. Next, please. And again, recall this image that I showed you from this morning, how uh, genetic, genetics is information. And this, I predict, um, we, in, 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 if not our lifetimes, in our children's lifetimes, we're already seeing it, but definitely in our children's lifetimes, we are seeing biology morph away from the soft sciences into the hard sciences. I don't know about you, but, well, yeah, I do know about you, because you're, you're roughly my age or so. But, you know, growing up, we had the hard sciences, right? Physics, chemistry, all of that over there. And over here, we had the squishy sciences. You know, humanities and literature and biology was over here. Because for the most part, biology was an observation science. we go out there and we'd observe animals doing things. Well, with the advent of genetic technology and the explosion in our knowledge, capturing the genomes of organism after organism after organism, biology is now coming over onto this side. It's becoming a hard science because it's information. It's the letters A and C and T and G, the genetic code. And with the, with the advance in, in computer power and memory, our ability to understand organisms and biology at the fundamental unit of information has ramifications that so far have been the domain of sci-fi authors. But science fiction is rapidly meeting reality. Biology is becoming an information science, just like computers and physics and chemistry. But we don't have to go that far down the stream to understand what I'm going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about pretty simple genetics. And let's move on, Greg. And um, it's kind of refresh that our genetic information resides on these molecules called the chromosomes. And for normal species like you and me, uh, they occur in pairs where you'll have homologs lined up with one another. Uh, most of them are in the nucleus of your cell. Some of them are in the mitochondria of the cell. And mitochondrial DNA made big time news this week. King Richard III. Hey, I was there last August when they thought they found his body. And it, this was big time news across the UK. We think we have found King Richard III under this <coughs> car park. Car park. It's not a parking lot, it's a car park. And so this was big news. They were talking all you know, last August. They were gonna, and they found his bones like the very first day. Uh, and this was the King Richard III Society. I tell you, English are the most hobby five species of people on earth. They got hobbies for everything. And they have societies for hobbies. Where else would you have a King Richard III Society? But they did, you know? So anyway, these people, they figured out where King Richard was buried. <laughs> where they think he was buried, and then they nailed it. I mean, boom. So the archaeology team came in, and they dug up his bones, and they found him, and boom, there he is. And they just finished, finished the genetic analysis using his mitochondrial DNA, which is only passed down maternally, and his last living ancestor. And I just heard, I just learned the other day, this may be old news, but this guy they found from Canada, who was King Richard III's last living uh, descendant, was the last in the chain, because his mother, had a sister, see, his mother did not have any daughters, and her sister had no children at all. So he was the last hope for pegging King Richard III's bones to a living ancestor, and they did it with mitochondrial DNA. That has nothing to do with my 
other than just to say that some DNA is passed down through the cytoplasm through your, through your mother, and only your mother. You probably heard about the Eve gene. You know, the evidence that we have that we're all common ancestors of a common mother. Sounds biblical, doesn't it? But for all the rest of our genes, you know, reside in the nucleus, and this is where we inherit most of the stuff that makes us what we are. On, please. And just to stylize things, I'm getting rid of the goofy looking chromosome X's, and let's just imagine now in a single diagram. And these, these strings of chromosomes have little segments of the letters A, C, T, and G, which, are, which we call genes. And these are the little segments that code for a particular thing that then gets transcribed into a protein that then turns into things like eye color and hair color and all the other stuff. You know, Aromite resistance, grooming behavior, you name it. Uh, they reside on genes. This is 19th century knowledge. You know, this goes back to uh, Gregor Mendel, some of his early work where he was figuring out how, just through, the, through probability, he was figuring out the, the initial means of inheritance. And then in the 1960s, we figured out the chemistry of DNA. But for the most part, Mendel works, what I have to say to you this afternoon. Our genes oftentimes occur in homologous uh, forms. You'll have like the dominant forms, called the dominant allele or recessive allele. In classical Mendelian genetics, if you have the dominant form, it's the dominant form that always expresses. So the individual on the other chromosome may be carrying the recessive form, but the recessive form only expresses if the other chromosome has the recessive form. All it takes is one dominant form to totally overmask whatever recessive form the individual may be carrying. Next, please. But the truth is, along any given chromosome, you're going to have a bazillion genes. There are different little segments of the letters A, C, T, G that combine to code for different things. And that is sort of the more a modern way of thinking of genes, a coding region, a region of the DNA strand that codes for something. And then the stuff of scientists like Greg Hunt is to figure out, you know, what does this section do before? And it involves really complicated behavioral studies to try to see what individuals, if they express this behavior or that, and if they carry that coding gene. And then it becomes the stuff of statistics to see if we can statistically show that this coding region always occurs when the individual does this. That's what genetics is like today. Information, and then all the labor of trying to attach the information to the character that the individual actually expresses. But again, for Mendelian genetics, what we're looking at here is an individual, a diagram of two chromosomes, different genes. Um, you'll notice, like for example, eye color. I just totally made this up. Q. One side is uppercase Q, the other side is lowercase. Uh, traditionally, we think of the dominant form in capital letters and the recessive form in uh, lowercase letters. Hygienic behavior, in this case, is both the dominant <coughs> form. And that's just kind of the, the terminology that's used in classical genetics. Next, please. So, here we have an individual showing the different possibilities in uh, most organisms and kind of uh, genes they carry. The individual on the far left has one gene on a pair of chromosomes here, and both forms of the gene this individual carries are dominant, S, and this individual is homo, the same, homozygous. The individual in the middle is heterozygous because of this particular gene. The individual is carrying the dominant and the recessive form of that character. This is how recessive genes can pop up in progeny that were not expressed in the parents. The parents were carrying the gene, but it was masked, it was not being expressed. Now in those pesky hymenoptera, we have yet another possibility, right? We have the hemizygous state, hemi, half. Uh, these individuals have only half of the genome of the species, and these, of course, are the drones. Now, given this, we can now move on to another principle. It's called heterozygosity versus homozygosity. And here we have a fictional chromosome pair, a fictional organism. And in every gene, this individual has the opposite homolog. Big S, little S, big A, little A, big T, little T, and so forth. This individual is hetero-different, heterozygous, or hybrid vigor. This is that 
barnyard dog that was talking about this morning. In contrast, we have the opposite possibility, homozygosity, where the individual has the same homolog at every gene site. Big S, big S, big A, big A, so forth. And again, as I mentioned this morning, usually, usually, not always, usually nature likes hybrid vigor. Nature likes a lot of genetic variation tossed out there for nature to act upon. And when you get individuals that are like this, they tend to be more genetically impoverished. They don't have as much genetic resources to call upon. I can give you an example. Um, I had a mentor when I started keeping bees. Does anybody know where 12 mile India is? Yep. Hey, I see you. Lots of hands going up here. All right. Well, the guy's name was Mr. Paul Champ. And Mr. Champ was a former president of this association. And Mr. Champ was my mentor. He, he taught me a lot of stuff. And we would go out in Mr. Champ's yards, and invariably we would find a colony of gone queenless or something. He said, ah, no problem here. Just get a friend of brood. You go over here and get out a friend of brood and stick down in there. And really? That's all you got to do? Yeah, that's all you got to do. You stick this frame in here and go raise a queen. Golly! Yeah, you, they did. You know, well, this was great. We all know this trick. Give them a frame of brood. Well, trouble is, Mr. Champ, that's all he did. And after a few years, I began noticing, uh, Mr. Champ, you know, your bees just don't look as good as, as Don Shenfield's bees do. You know, they, they just got, don't nearly have as much brood. You know? What he was, I think this is it. You know, year after year, year after year. This is all he did, Green Queen, just swap brood in the garden. And so eventually, you know, genes erode. They get lost. You know, colonies die. And you get fewer and fewer variants of a gene over time. If that population is closed, and there's nothing new coming in, um, it's like nature just pushes toward homozygosity in time. So this was an example early in my beekeeping experience of what happens when things get homozygous. Next, please. There's another thing that happens when things go homozygous. You have read, and rightly so, and heard, and rightly so, that gender in bees is largely a gene dose thing. Uh, if a queen does not mate, uh, if a worker's ovaries develop, and they, they have not mated, they will produce eggs, the eggs are haploid, and those individuals turn into males. We all know this. And it's very easy to say, well, gosh, um, hemizygous individuals are male in the hymenoptera. And that's true. Fundamentally, that's true. But, we say this morning how nature is never as easy as you think it is. Jerzy Wojcik is his name. He's Polish and he's still alive. He's one of those guys that will never die. Uh, Jerzy Wojcik in the 1960s figured out that it's more complicated than that. What you have in determining gender in the bee is actually controlled at a gene site. There's a gene, there's loci that determine whether that individual is going to be female or male. And it works like this. If the individual is hemizygous, it's a male. If the individual is heterozygous, it is a female. So far, so good. But if the individual at that site is homozygous, it's a male. And, and Jersey Boyke figured this out. Now you're, you're sitting there thinking, wait a minute. The thing is, you can have drones that have a whole two pair of chromosomes, but you as beekeepers, you as scientists and observers, never see them because the workers can detect these homozygous males and they eat them. So they vanish from observation, but they are there. So it is not gene dose that dictates gender in the honeybee. It's genetically controlled like any other character with a dominant and a recessive form that regulates it. But it just so happens, if it's homozygous at that sock, they're aborted and eaten, removed. Okay, so what you see then as a beekeeper is this, spotty brood, <coughs> spotty brood. And if you're interested in breeding bees, you've got to know this. This is like, you got to know this kind of stuff, all right? When your bees become inbred, 
all of the genes presumably are becoming inbred at the equal rate. It just so happens the most visible one for you as an observer is this, spotty brood. So it becomes a proxy for the homozygosity across the whole population. You don't want this. This is bad stuff. It, it, it just it, it gains you nothing. The colony is, is not as productive, for one thing. It's not making as much viable brood. But secondly, it's a good indicator to you that that, that colony is, in general, homozygous, and nature doesn't like homozygosity. Heterozygosity is a good thing. You can measure this. Um, we actually take a piece of cardboard and we figure out how much 10 by 10 makes 100 cells. And then you can lay that, I think I got a picture coming up, I'm not sure. But you can lay that cross brood and then just count the, the missing cells and it gives you a direct percentage. And just take a bunch of these measures and it gives you a numeric measure of the amount of inbreeding in that colony. I'll, I'll show you that in the next piece of it. Right. I don't know why I put that there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that. That's where all the action is. We got the queen. Uh, breeding with her is always complicated um, because of her habit of multiple mating. And this, in classical breeding, which has been animated largely from our brothers and sisters in the animal sciences who breed cows and pigs, um, we, we have pretty much followed their lead in breeding and the kind of breeding systems that we have come up with. And it has always been complicated by the, our knowledge that the honeybee multiply mates. So if you have a colony right here that is expressing something that you like, and you decide, I'm going to graft from this colony because I like it. So you go in there and you graft, 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 graft. Well, what if it is honey production you're after? And what if only two of the subfamilies are actually responsible for all that honey production that you see? And that means only every two and 15 eggs that you graft are in fact carrying the character that you think you're selecting for. Okay, this is nothing new. We've known this forever in bee breeding. But it's a real liability to quick progress in the honeybee breeding. I think this is one reason uh, for my cynicism that I expressed early in my talk of why bee breeding has, has really been difficult. And for that right there, which one do you graft? Which, which egg do you graft out of that mess? Which is the subfamily responsible for uh, whatever it is that you're selecting for. This is a problem. Next. Well, the design, there are three classic breeding designs that are out there. This is all review. This is, this is, this is old stuff. But you, I think it's worth just kind of hitting on the head uh, before we move into some of the stuff that I think is more interesting toward the end of my talk. One method is maternal selection and open mating. I would say that 90% of the so-called bee breeding in this country is that very first bullet. And it is what I just described. I like this colony. I'm going to graft from this colony. You graft from this colony, and the daughters just mate with somebody. That's, that's it. That, that's, that's maternal selection and open mating. Um, it works. It works. Okay? There's, there's a limit to my cynicism here. It, we, and I'll show you some of these examples. A second bullet is the so-called inbred hybrid scheme. And the third bullet is the famous closed population breeding scheme uh, by Harry Laidlaw and Rob Page, who published this back in the early 80s. And this is by far the most sophisticated of the breeding schemes that I'm going to unpack for you here this afternoon. Next, please. And here's an example. It's one of the best examples I know of an asset, you check in the asset column for the maternal selection open breeding model. This is Nick Calderon and Kim Fonder. It publishes back in the, oh gosh, early 80s. This again is not new. And what they did was practice maternal selection and open mating for the character of honey production. And just to, to, to provide a challenge and a control to their design, they also selected for negative honey production. So they were, they, were, they were selecting for both the high and the low. And they were able, as you see here, very quickly get divergence. Their high line from their low line within one, two, three, four generations of selecting. It just so happens that some characters are more heritable than others. 
Inheritable is, you can kind of think of it as um, the potency for selection. It's responsiveness to selection. And remember how this morning I mentioned how a honeybee is domesticable? And, and Greg was correct in it. He really thinks they're not domestic. And he's got a point. You know, we don't control their feed necessarily. We don't control their breeding. That's the whole subject of this talk. So the whole idea of them being domesticated, you know, you know, so what? But it, it, it just so happens that honey production is pretty heritable. And it also just so happens that defensive behavior is comparatively heritable. So the two most important characters for humans just happen to be relatively responsive to selection in the honeybee. And this adds to our love affair of the honeybee. With relatively modest effort, we've been able to increase their honey production and make them gentler. So, now let's take a look at the inbred hybrid scheme. We do have a history of this in this country, of uh, so-called star line and midnight lines that they was producing back in the 70s. Uh, I remember these. I, I'm old enough to remember these. And this is a breeding station that they didn't maintain for about 10 years uh, down in Florida. And they were using the classic model that the breeders, the corn breeders, use up here in the Midwest for producing hybrid stock. And what it involves is creating two inbred parental lines, which you see up there at the top. Here we have a fictional individual, capital A, capital A, capital B, capital B, so forth. And on the other side we have lowercase a, lowercase b, lowercase c. So we have two parental lines that have been inbred. And then when you, and these, these, these bees are miserable. I mean, these are sorry bees, okay? But when you cross them, you get dynamite because a maximum number of genes are now heterozygous when you do this, and you get an individual that's just dynamite. Okay, so this is a good scheme. It's a good system. You know, the Midnights and the Star Lines were pretty darn good bees. Um, however, when Varroa showed up, um, they proved utterly incapable of any resistance against the mite. For whatever reason, they just fell off the cliff and we've never seen these bees since. You know, it, uh, they have abandoned it. But in principle, it works. How do you create these inbred lines? You can do some really funky things with bees. Uh, you can gas a virgin queen with CO2. She'll produce drones. Take those drones and inseminate her with them. That's pretty weird, but you can do that. And these are just one of the methods that you can use to create your inbred lines. Um, so, try this if you want. It's kind of fun. It's a viable system. It, 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 cre it creates an individual that's, in general, vigorous, but not necessarily selected for anything. You, know, it doesn't necess you have no reason to think that it's going to be you know, hygienic or a groomer. It might. You don't know. You're not selected for anything. All you've done is just create hybridity. Well, the next scheme is the most sophisticated one. Rob Page, very label, closed population plan. And the closed population scheme is a, an exercise in compromise. Uh, having your cake and eating it too. The, these, these, these authors recognize that in breeding depression, you just can't avoid it. If you're going to select for something, Selection is synonymous with genetic narrowing. Okay, think about it. When I'm, when I'm out there selecting for something, I want this. This is what I'm selecting for. And you're selecting for this, generation after generation after generation. Well, you're, you're getting that, supposedly. But there's also other things that are sort of dropping off the cliff, and you have no idea what they are. That, by the way, is the only advantage of natural selection. There's more time for the correction of mistakes to occur in natural selection. But in a human scale of selection, we don't have that time, the luxury of correction. So we're prone to making more mistakes. We're selecting for this and losing that. And we may not know what that is, and that may be more important than this. And so you can you know, kind of make mistakes that way. It just, you can't avoid it. Selection in human scale is genetic narrowing. Well, they, Page and Laidlaw recognized this, and they said, okay, well, let's work with this. Okay, given this reality, let's do this. 
And he said, what we're going to do is collect a population of at least 35 queens. And within this closed population, we will select for X. And what we're going to do is every generation we're going to select, let's say, the top 10% of the mothers, maternal selection, these top 10% colonies with the best performers, and you're going to graft from those top 10% performers, and we're going to inseminate them with the drones from all of the population, including the bottom 90%. So you can think of the closed population scheme, it's sort of like, um, it's like taking two steps forward, and then one step back. Because when you outbreed with all 90%, you're kind of losing what you were selecting for, but at the same time, you're kind of slowing down homozygosity. So the next generation, we select our top 10% daughters, two steps forward, one step back. It's a compromise. It's a compromise between selecting for X and minimizing inbreeding at the sex low side. Okay? And um, Page and Laidlaw recognize that this is a finite story. This is a story that will come to an end. And on average, this is good for about 20 generations before inbreeding will finally catch up with you. And you start getting so much spotty brood that the population is no longer as productive as beekeepers would like it to be. There have been some notable plans. Uh, I think the best I can think of is Sue Covey's New World Carniolan that has used this model. So the closed population scheme is viable and it has, um, it has some success stories to back it up. Thanks, please. Uh, let's get that, everything I just said. Uh, also central to the closed population scheme is the idea of selection. This is very much a classical selection-oriented way to go about getting better bees, whatever we're calling better. And it's only as good as the accuracy of our measuring methods. So it involves real empirical measures. Um, weigh the colonies next. Measure the brood area so that you actually have numbers here to select, quantifying, empiricizing the whole enterprise. Uh, defense behavior. This is a method of uh, you know, Greg and Ernesto who championed this. But this is what I did when I was in graduate school, just drag a red leather patch. It's got to be red, by the way. <laughs> Far too cold. <laughs> so there we would drag these red patches across and have a time and then count the number staying. So you end up with numbers, is the point I'm making. We're, we're, we're getting numbers here that we can then use to make very objective selection decisions. Next. Oh, hygienic. Yeah, this is. Big stuff now. And again, it's, it's empirical, something you can assign a number to. Um, we use PPC pipe now, but we used to use flashing. And you just make a little cylinder there, figure out how many cells are encompassed uh, within the uh, circumference of your circle, pour in liquid nitrogen out in the field, uh, put it back in for 24 hours. The brood is now dead. Uh, this is a, a proxy measure for brood disease. You don't want to actually put an American fowl brood in there and test and see if they remove it, so you kill it instead with a, a sanitary method like liquid nitrogen. And then after 24 hours, you see how much of the brood the bees have removed. The colony on the bottom right, I go back a minute, uh, it's you know, moderate hygienic behavior, whereas the one on the bottom left is expressing 100% hygienic behavior. Next, please. Mites, again, this is. You know, quantifiable stuff, whether it's mites on the bottom board, whether it's mites in the brood, whether it's the percentage of the mites on the bottom that are chewed. Uh, again, these are numbers. It's, it's, it's a, it's a number-driven kind of activity. Next. I want to give you a... I, I want to show you what this looks like in real terms. I, I think this is useful. I hope this won't bore you to tears. But I want to show you um, a project we did back about six or seven years ago at BGA, I got a small uh, southern region IPM grant to try to do a closed population breeding scheme uh, looking for everything that we would like. I wanted the perfect bee, okay? So I was gonna select for it. And so we got some funding, and, and I just wanna walk you through this to, to get an idea of what a serious 
selection program looks like and some of the problems you run into. Uh, here we are standardizing our initial nukes you know, with, with uh, near equal populations. And then we would, uh, we, we had daughter queens that were introduced into all of these. And then we began selecting for things. Next, please. And here's some of the things we chose to select for. I wanted everything. I wanted low varroa mites. I wanted high hygienic. I wanted lots of brood, lots of honey, lots of gentleness, and I wanted lots of solidness. My grammar may not have been so good on that list, but you get, I wanted it all, right? Well, what I did was then consult the literature and see if any of these things were in fact heritable. I found that that's the far right column. They, they kind of are. The, the values for heritability in Varroa range from 0.46 to 1.24. Hygienic 65%, brood 30 to 50%, honey 16 to 100%. You know, they were all, I had a basis for thinking I could actually select for these characters. And then I weighted each one of them. And that's what this first column of numbers right here, this is a, this is a fraction. I, I decided what characters I wanted to be prioritized, and I gave them a weighting factor depending on how important I thought it was. Well, I, I gave Varroa 20% weight value. Hygienic, 20%. Brood, 10%. Honey, 10%. Gentleness, 10%. And solidness, 30%. I really wanted to select for the absence of inbreeding. And so, that all adds up to one, by the way. And you do this with your characters. If you're selecting for multiple characters, assign them a weighting value. Next, please. Then we went out and measured, and this is a line of raw data. This is boring, but this is the nuts and bolts of, of breeding, so stick with me. What we have here is a raw data for generation one, colony number two, and then our varroa count. One varroa mite on the sticky sheet. That's pretty darn good. Uh, hygienic was 43%. Yeah, not so good. Brood, 3,500 uh, centimeters, 4.2 kilograms, honey, no stings. That's good. And solidness, 70%. Well, gosh, do I like this colony or not? You know, some things I like, some things I don't. But another problem that's even more important, we are not comparing apples and apples here. If any of you are good at Excel, you know, spreadsheet, you can convert values into what's called a z-score which converts, I mean, think about this. Our numbers are not the same kind of numbers. I've got percentages there intermixed with whole numbers. Uh, I've got four-digit numbers, one-digit numbers. I'm all over the map. What the Z-score will do with Excel is convert all that to a Z-score. I have a statistician that I worked with in England, and he was French. And he looked for all the world like, uh, who was our last president? Sarkozy. This guy looked like Sarkozy. He also had a very dry wit. And he had opinions about what Georgia and USA is like. And so I, I had a tendency to sort of aggravate him on. And again, you know, Athens being the home of the B-52s, they had a song about Planet Z. Yeah, so I would send this guy MP3s of Planet Z just to show him that Athens really is a hotbed of culture. Um, statistically, he kind of sort of appreciated it, but he's still very French. Uh, but anyway, I sent him a, an MP3 of Planet Z to remind him about the Z-score. And in the next image, you will see that line of data that has been converted to Z-scores. What the Z does is calculate the average for every character, and then assigns that particular character a relative value depending on the mean. So half of them will be positive values, half of them negative values. So once you have a line of Z data, you can immediately look at the Z score and know if for that character, if that colony was above average or below average. It's, it's really quite an elegant little manipulation, and you can do it on Excel. This isn't heavy duty stuff. So anyway, we now have a Z score for colony two, generation one. Next, please. And the next thing I did was create this index. I wanted to give it a score, and if any of you are school teachers, You've done this. This is, again, it's not heavy-duty math. This is just waiting. If you gave a final exam,
and you wanted 30% of the semester's grade to be on that final exam, and you put a point .3 in front of that student's score. That's all we're talking about here, calculating a grade for this comic. And every character was assigned that weighting factor that I assigned it way in advance, and it had a z-score, and if it was negative, it pulled its score down. If it was positive, it pulled its score up. And let's look, Greg, it's on the next line. What we got here's the selection index for colony two, generation one, and it's got negative values and the weighting factors for every character multiplied together, and we ended up with a negative selection index score. This colony failed. It did not make the grade. And again, using Excel, you can sort and rank them and just like that, find your top 10%. But this is what it takes. Okay, we, we banty about the term be breathing left and right and never stop and think about what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about. It's not just something you just walk out there and, and just, well, I like that play, you know? Next one. So anyway, what we did was then apply these criteria to our colonies and we, we did all of that. We selected the top 10% and made it back to the remaining 90%. And what you're seeing here is our progress between years 2003 and 7. Hygienic behavior, you know, doesn't really excite me to tell you the truth. It's kind of up, down, up, down. I don't think we really gained a whole lot there. Next, please, Greg. Uh, brood area, this is probably our, our shining star in our crown. We, we seem to have kind of an upward nudge in brood production in this population. Next. Brood solidness. Okay, we were able to sustain uh, the heterozygosity in this population relatively well. It didn't go down. But when it came to Varroa counts, oh man, it was a train wreck. And, and Varroa, arguably, is pretty important. So I, I deemed this as a very underwhelming result. Uh, I, was, I was kind of discouraged all this. And yes, there's many things that you know, maybe we were selecting for too much. Um, you, any, any time you select for more than one thing, you're subtracting away your selection pressure on the other stuff. And I may have just been too ambitious. Or maybe my methods were too sloppy. Um, but nevertheless, we, we gave this, my labs, pretty much more than 50% effort. Uh, for these five seasons and don't really have a whole lot to show for it. So I have enormous sympathy for people out in the ranks like you, beekeepers, who are really trying to make serious progress and, and create a product that has been genetically improved. I think it's worth asking the question, what do we mean by a viable breeding product? What would Okay, let's say, well, I cannot produce a queen that you will buy because it's, if, to, to get what that queen's worth, I ought to get $100 a hop of a queen. Really, I mean, if you've tried that, you will totally agree with me. I, I should get $100 for every queen I raise, and then maybe the market will be viable. But the, the market won't buy it. It's too expensive. Well, does that not beg the question? What if that $100 queen really was worth it? Okay, what if it, okay, $100, $100. What would it take that, if, if you had, could not use any chemicals, if that colony lived, okay, let's just start with that, and it didn't die, is that worth $100? Uh, if it made 25% more honey and lived and did not die, would that be worth another hundred dollars? Uh, why not? Why is it that that queen is, is, is not worth it? That begs the whole question that I'm talking about. Where is the queen that I cannot afford to not have in my hive? <laughs> Ask a dairyman, and he cannot not have a Holstein cow as the foundation of his herd, or a lamb-raised pig, or a new rock swine, or these different poster children in American agriculture. We have evidences of this throughout the history of agriculture. The Green Revolution back in the 1970s with hybrid rice. And in all sorts of other sectors of agriculture, uh, genetics has just really 
led the charge and caused revolutionary changes, game-changing changes in their industries. That has not happened in apiculture. I disagree with that. Well, what can the biology of the animal tell us? And this goes back to our lecture uh, this morning about the superorganism. And I hope I have been somewhat persuasive in arguing that the biology of Apis mellifera has been heavily pushed toward polyandry. Next, please. And in fact, in the last 15 years or so, there has been a series of papers that have kind of <clears throat> taken a hold of this and really worked on it. Uh, one of the real leaders in this is a guy named Paul Sheena Temple. And um, he's talking here about the evolution of female multiple mating in social time and opera, and how pathogens and parasites have been the big evolutionary driver pushing these, these early species toward polyandry. What was the hybrid vigor that they needed for which polyandry was the answer? And what they needed was some kind of resistance against the parasites and pathogens that readily affect a social insect nest. What this means, folks, and this is really cool, you could argue that Nozema and AFB, Varroa mites, you name it, are the reasons honeybees are polyandrous. The honeybee has taken elaborate steps to capture genetic variation, not genetic narrowness. Which makes me wonder if it doesn't really want to be selective. That's why I titled my talk, Be Breeding Fact or Fiction. Now, I am going to come around and posit a model that captures all of this, but bear with me for the moment. Can we, in fact, breed the honeybee? Just, just hang on to that intention for a few minutes. Well, there's some other papers that have come out. Dave Tarby, um, Greg my colleague down at NC State, Tom Seeley, the author of Honeybee Democracy, uh, this came out a few years ago. Loop lower disease incidents in honeybee colonies headed by polyandrous queens. They show that there's not as much brood disease, in this case it's foul brood and chalk brood, when they inseminated queens with larger numbers of drones. Next please. There we go. Heather Matilla, who's now up at Boston. And again, Tom Seeley. Genetic diversity in honeybee colonies enhances fitness, productivity in colonies. Next. Well, at first blush, it's easy to say, well, all it is is more, more genes, right? More genetic variation. You got more <coughs> genetic assets in the bank. Darn it. Nature is just not that simple. You, we want it to be simple. Come on, nature, be simple. And we find, well, no, it's not quite that simple. Any of you who have done economics, or any of you who have done plant fertility, any plant scientists or fertility experts out there, you understand the, uh, the law of diminishing returns. You add nitrogen to a cornfield, right? there's uh, more nitrogen, more, 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 then it plateaus, right? And you can, you can dump nitrogen on the field, and you're not going to get another kernel more. Well, this is the case with genetic diversity. If you just simply look at the number of genes in a colony, relative to the number of matings that a queen goes through, they plateau at about the 10th mating. So it is not just simple genetic diversity. The number of genes. Next, please. And for this, we have a paper that came out in the late 90s by Stefan Fuchs and Robin Moritz. And they came up with what I think is a, a plausible explanation. This is a, a theoretic paper. They're talking about the, the evolution of extreme polyandry in the honeybee, and they, they lay out for the reader that many of these desirable characters, they're very specialized, these genes are in fact rare, A, and B, very often they're recessive, which kind of strikes you as odd, doesn't it? I mean, if hygienic is so advantageous, why isn't it dominant for crying out loud? It does explain why it erodes away so rapidly in the absence of intense selection. And it seems that the best explanation here is these genes are so potent and they have such powerful uh, survival benefit that they can very quickly cause a genetic narrowing and fixation, you might say. What if that colony was entirely hygienic? Marla Spivak has done this, by the way. She has selected for hygienic behavior to the point of a jettison brood that's healthy. Okay. Too much of a good thing. 
These characters are so potent that they would instantly, within a matter of just a few generations, genetically narrow the population to the point that they couldn't sting anymore. You know, I'm being facetious. Or they couldn't forage anymore. Or they couldn't regulate their temperature anymore. Because there's other stuff that's actually more important, isn't there? You know, this stuff is really more important than whether they got grooming behavior or not. But if grooming exacts such a huge selection of benefit, then within one or two generations, they're all going to be groomers and some of this other stuff fall off the cliff and be maladaptive in the long run. So even though it's counterintuitive to us in our short little human lifespans, in geologic time, it's better for these characters to be rare and recessive. It strikes us as odd in our short little lifespans. So, hence, polyandry. I'm going to mate with as many guys as I can, not just for the simple mathematical benefit of more genes, but so that I can capture that rare allele over there, and that rare one right over there, and that one, and i got to mate with a lot of males to cast that net as wide as I can to capture some of those beneficial alleles. Next, please. Well, uh, I want to conclude um, by giving you a, a, a brief teaser of my work. I was on a sabbatical in England this last year in York, uh, which is where the little red A thing there is, not too far from Liverpool and the Beagle Museum, uh, right next door. To the next, please. Uh, to the, to the, this is the National Bee Unit, which is kind of equivalent to their Beltsville lab. Where they have some regulatory and some research and some outreach efforts at that unit. I was told it looked like the headquarters of the enemy in the James Bond movie. Pretty, pretty rough, actually. A home of York Minster, uh, one of Europe's great cathedrals. I had, a, I had a lot of season pass and I was in there all the time. It, it's good for your soul to visit York Minster. I recommend it. Are any of the cathedrals in Europe? Next, please. Uh, yes, yes, any of you who have read the James Harriet novels, All Creatures Great and Small, it was just a short little hop away from the Dales. Next. And this is um, Heather Moores, who right there close in Yorkshire and North Dales. They do practice migratory bee keeping up there and get the Heather honey. Next. And it's a thixotropic honey. It's gelatinous. And it's really quite a pain in the neck to process. So, this is where I was. Oh, by the way, they maintained there an apiary that they did not treat, uh, not for any varroa control program, but because they had a thriving population of the Browla mite. You know, the louse, that's a little wingless fly that's a natural, I can't call it a parasite, we call it a commensal. It appears to be a harmless nest mate. And I see that queen, they love queens. And so you'll find queens that are just full of these little browla cecum mites. Or louse, they're not a mite. It's quite fun. Well, what we did, we were interested in this idea of polyandry, and we kind of wanted to push the issue a little bit and say, okay, um, Natural selection has maxed about the tenth drone. Uh, presumably, birds you know, are predatory, so there's a real risk. You can't just mate, 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 or there's a countervailing negative pressure. So, that, you know, 15 is kind of where natural selection is played out. Well, what if, next, what if we take away that liability with the agency of instrumental insemination? And I'm delighted to see at this meeting. Uh, a real emphasis on instrumental insemination and the uh, Joe Latchall device and some people here have been practicing it because I think this is this is very very important to the kind of model that I'm trying to unpack for you here today, which you know what it's going to be. It's multiple mating. We inseminated in England this past summer. Uh, we had three sets of queens. Uh, one we inseminated with 15 drones, one with 30 drones, and one with 60 drones. One set of each. And um, I was giving this talk in, in the south of England one day, and this little guy in the back of the room, he, he piped up and he said, won't she pop? <laughs> <laughs> good question. I said, well, well, we did. It's a good question. We'd, we'd collect the seam and then we'd discharge it. We'd, we'd uh, uh, dilute it in half with saline, and then we'd mix it up, and then we'd withdraw so that we were giving uniform volumes, so in spite of the different drone numbers. I just want to show you some of the data. We didn't get finished. Uh, I need to go back. Darn. Um, <coughs> coming spring to finish it because it was the first time in my professional life that I've ever been handicapped by weather. I got it. You guys, you know, 
the weather's really good down where I live, and it's like kind of never bad. Or if it is bad, just wait till tomorrow and it'll be good. So I've lived my whole professional life in Louisiana and Georgia, and I have never thought twice about weather. It's just not on our map, right? Well, over there, I was brought to a rude realization that there is weather in England. And the same system that gave you heat and drought uh, gave England its historic high in precipitation and weight temperatures. And there's a lot of history in England. I picked the wettest summer in history to spend my sabbatical in England. And I was just breaking it out. I was wearing sweaters until August. So anyway, anyway, in spite of that, here's our data. Um, in all of these graphs, the 15 inseminated group, the 30 inseminated, and the 60. And what you're seeing here is mite loads. Just mites on sticky sheets after 24 hours. I, I like the direction of the data. With more polyandry, we had a downward trajectory of mites. Next, please. Uh, and we actually measured the colony varroa population by taking samples of mites on bees and mites in brood. We take a little more robust measure, and then again, Speaks for itself there. Next, please. Uh, brood area, there was an upward trajectory in brood production as polyandry increased. Next. This was fun. And any of you who have a kid in your life, a kid who may be interested in science fair projects, this is something for them to do. We were interested in the ability of bees in these different polyandrous colonies. Uh, to recruit and find a new, a new resource, a new novel resource. Remember that amoeba I was talking about this morning? How can they find it faster? Here's what we did. We, we found this old uh, field of little sea grape. Next image. And we found these big, flat, plastic horticulture things, uh, tub stuff, tub things. And we, we put hive screens inside them. Next. And we filled them up with pink syrup. We wanted it neon pink. Next, please. And then we sat out there and we waited for the bees to come and we just kind of watched it. It was really quite a fun show to watch. Now meanwhile, back at the ranch, what we had done is pre-weighed an empty comb of white, newly drawn fruit comb and we had weighed it so we knew it and it was empty and it was white. And we stuck it in the middle of the root nest and then we let this all happened for four hours. So they had four hours to discover this new source. The next day, we would do it again, but at a different location. So they're always discovering it. Okay, it was discovery and recruitment that we were trying to measure. And after four hours, next please, we would take out of the center of these brood nests, our virgin brood comb, weigh it. And during, by doing it only four hours, there's a reason for doing it just four hours. They, don't, they do not fill up the comb in that short a time. It gives you a finite number of pink cells that you can count. Not all the cells are pink. You know, they're out there foraging for other stuff too, but you, don't, you only want to know how much pink stuff. So you, you take the weight and then multiply that by the fraction of all cells that were pink and it tells you the gram of pink syrup that, that colony found within four hours. So uh, it really worked. We, we were very pleased with this method. And uh, for us, it worked really well. Next, please. And there you go. The milligrams of total food foraged during that four hours, pink or not, increased as colony went up. Next, please. And the amount of the novel pink syrup that was found also went up during those four hours as the colonies were polyandrous. <coughs> is this reality? Is this, is this a, 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 a glimpse into natural reality? Um, it's, it's very early data. It represents about two weeks worth of data collecting. Uh, we have not yet found statistical difference in these results. Um, again, our, our window of collecting data were very brief, but the data are tight and I was, I think, reasonably encouraged by the, the direction that these data are pointing us. If this is a glimpse into reality and not just something that the experimenter is hoping for, if this is a glimmer of reality, then I would suggest that the reason it's moving in this direction is because these colonies are, in fact, more genetically diverse. They have a broader set of subfamilies that are good for more things. You know, we may have had, just happened mathematically, probability, uh, that we had more good recruiters 
as polyandry increased in our colonies. More groomers, more ankle biters, uh, more hygienic. Uh, I think it's no coincidence that the Russian bees are not famous for any one character, are they? When it comes to Baroque resistance, they seem to express a lot of different characters. Is this another natural hint pushing in this direction? Next, please. So let me recap here, and then I'll wrap up. Um, it is possible to select the targeted straight traits in the honeybee. And selecting, propagating, and retaining those characters has, in fact, been difficult to the point that I would say the product has not engendered a compelling demand. If we really had a product that really worked, I think beekeeper would pay $100 a pound. And but that, but that value markets are driven by value, aren't they? How, how, much, is, how much is your house worth? Your house is only worth what someone is willing to buy it for. That's the definition of value, isn't it? And that value treadmill has just not got kicked up and going in bee breeding. Why? How many lifetimes have we been doing this? At least two? Show me the goods. Okay. In contrast, we have what I think is a persuasive story that polyandry is central to the evolutionary history of Apis mellifera. It's not tangential, it's central. Does this have anything to say to us? And then finally, just to pour water on all of my cynicism, I want to say that I think the two models are completely and entirely, not only compatible, but mutually necessary. Because if polyandry and rare alleles are in fact as important as I'm trying to make a case for, it begs the question, where do those important rare alleles come from? And I would suggest a complementary model would be a network of people who really are selecting for groomers, really are selecting for hygienic, really are selecting for short development time, AFB resistance, EFB resistance, gentleness, productivity, everything that we want. <clears throat> But then, should we be then instead marketing in drones? And having co-ops that result in a highly polyandrous queen that captures all of these rare alleles that all of the members in the periphery are selecting for? You see how it all ties together? This isn't some mutually exclusive revolutionary thing I'm talking about. It's just sort of a shifting of the focus and the energy that I'm proposing. I think we have been too long influenced by our neighbors in the animal sciences who are very happily making do with a deployed animal. We don't have that same kind of an animal. I think we need to pay more attention to the biology and see how we can capture the benefits of polyandry and join it with classical selection. Thanks, please.